Hi, this is Anthony. Welcome back to my show. This video is the second part of two about titanium particles on the tie. You can watch this one first, but please check out the other video that I posted yesterday for more information that I think is very relevant and that you'll enjoy. It's called D.B. Cooper, The Terrible Trouble with the Titanium Tie, Part 1. So that you don't start watching this video and start thinking to yourself, what about this? What about that? He's not saying this. I'll give you a very brief synopsis of the previous video as it relates to this one. I argue that before we can interpret something or come to a conclusion about a piece of evidence, we have to make sure that the fact is really an accurate fact. Recently, prominent D.B. Cooper researcher Eric Euless has come out with a theory that three particles of titanium found on a clip-on tie left behind by Cooper were an exotic alloy of titanium and antimony, which he argues was only found at one facility in Pennsylvania at that time and has narrowed down his suspects to one of approximately eight people that worked in that lab. After doing some videos where he did not reveal the name of the individual that he suspected, eventually he did reveal the name, which is Vince Peterson, a person who is now deceased. So it's very clear in this example that the fact is that titanium found on the tie was an alloy, in this case an alloy of titanium and antimony. However, other news articles have stated that the three particles were pure titanium and not an alloy, and the basis for this research comes from the research that was conducted by Tom K. Tom heads up a group called Citizen Sleuths, and on their website they state those three particles were pure titanium. However, we have to remember that Eric Euless's interpretations is based on his reading of Tom K's findings. I'm going to briefly show information from the internet concerning that so you know that I'm not just making it up. But the question that arises is, was the titanium really an alloy or was it pure? If it was an alloy, then why do the original researchers, the people who identified these particles on the tie, on their website state, that it was pure titanium. If it was pure, how did it get misconstrued to be a specific alloy that was then traced back to a particular facility and then one of the employees at that facility identified and in fact publicly identified as the likely suspect in the D.B. Cooper case? And here I don't know where the error occurred and of course if Eric Euless has made an error in his interpretation from the reports, let's not have anybody gang up on him. As I pointed out in the previous video, the whole purpose of all of us being interested in the D.B. Cooper case is trying to find who the person was. No matter which researcher or citizen sleuth or YouTuber or YouTube viewer is the one who makes the suggestion. And I think, quite frankly, what will really solve it is hopefully DNA eventually. Okay, but I'm not done with the titanium question. There's a couple things that I'd like to bring up that I think are extremely important if it is the case that the titanium was an alloy. So is it factually true that this facility called Remcrew in Pennsylvania was the only place that this alloy could be found? I'm going to argue it's likely not accurate that this particle could only be found at Remcrew. I'm going to first reference a posting by a guy named Nikki at the dbcooperforum.com website. I will have his whole posting in the show notes to this video. Please be sure to read that whole post in the show notes so that you have what seems like fairly accurate information from a knowledgeable person. And if you do read it, what I continue to say from here on out will make more sense if you have the context and what the facts seem to be. And of course, because this is the internet, you can just click pause right now if you want to read the show notes. Okay, it seems that three researchers from the Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio, are the ones who applied for the patent. But as the poster argues, because they were at a nonprofit, they had to use Remcrew as what might be described as a commercial agent or sponsor because Battelle is a nonprofit and couldn't profit from revenue generated from the anticipated patent. I'm not a patent attorney. I don't know if that understanding is legally true, but it makes sense. And by the way, here's a little bit of information from Battelle from Wikipedia. And it turns out that the patent application was denied by the patent office, and then there was a lawsuit filed concerning that. 
And again, patents are often denied because they may already impinge upon existing patents or may not be considered patentable for some other reasons. In the show notes, I will have a link to the patent application, which you can find online, and a link to the lawsuit. But let's think about this. The actual discovery in this narrative, if we were to believe it, took place at the Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. One imagines if these three engineers had developed this process for a titanium antimony alloy, that they themselves and perhaps others in their work area would come into contact with particles of this particular alloy, right? So before REM crew even comes into the picture, we have people at the Battelle Institute dealing with this exotic metal. Now, assuming that in fact the three particles of titanium on the tie were the titanium alloy and not pure titanium, as originally stated by Tom K., then after research at the Patel Institute, perhaps there was further utilization at Remcru. Now, it turns out that the patent was not granted, and this particular alloy does not seem to have been put into commercial use, evidently probably because there were better alloys that could be utilized more effectively. But remember, and I'm not a lawyer, but just because somebody has a patent on something doesn't mean that other people can't work with that particular material. The patent protects somebody for 10 years so that they can commercialize a particular product or process. Other people can be working with the substance and if they're able to materially prove upon it, then they can get a patent for that process. So even if REM crew had a patent, which they didn't, and produced it commercially, which they did not seem to have, other people could have been working with this alloy at the same time. Do we have any evidence of this? Before I answer that, I'm going to point out that while I'm not a chemist or a metallurgist, and while there may be some people who watch these videos or participate in DB Cooper online forums, I would caution you that if you're not an expert in this field, just as I'm not an expert in this field, we need to be extremely cautious when making any conclusions or even when we're accepting as accurate what other people are stating. Again, as I pointed out in my video yesterday, if a fact is not correct, then all of the conclusions resulting from it are going to be an error. Okay, that being said, just doing a casual search of the internet, here is an English language Scandinavian scientific journal article from 1962 discussing four new titanium antimony alloys. My understanding is that the research was undertaken in Norway. And again, many scholarly journals are not yet digitized and online. And in particular, research done behind the Iron Curtain, such as the Soviet Union, which produces perhaps most of the world's titanium and did a lot of research on production of titanium and aerospace and other defense related sectors, is not likely going to show up at all certainly not in English language Google searches. I'm going to stop here on that topic, but to summarize, my concern is these three particles, if they are pure titanium, as originally stated by citizen sleuths, then it could come from any place. If they are, in fact, three particles of titanium antimony alloy that was originally developed at Battelle Memorial Institute, and then perhaps subsequently at Remcru, but possibly at many other facilities, which would not necessarily publish their findings unless they made some type of breakthrough, then there could be far more than eight REM crew individuals from which to pick a D.B. Cooper suspect. On the topic of the tie, the FBI determined that the tie in question was one that had been sold for a few years at J.C. Penney and cost a couple dollars. I believe that it was black and it was a clip-on. This is exactly the type of tie that you would expect engineers and people in that field to wear in the 1960s and early 1970s. I think that most D.B. Cooper researchers agree that ties like this were worn by such people as engineers in the aerospace industry, although that does not necessarily mean that that's who Cooper was or that he worked at a particular facility. And here we'll ignore the particles found on the tie, only looking at the fact that people wore ties like that. I think for engineers it would be very convenient to have a tie that was a clip-on because sometimes even engineers have to get on the ground on their back and slide under a piece of equipment to examine it. And being able to quickly remove it while eating lunch is convenient. I've had jobs where I've worn ties with suits or suit jackets. In my case I had a variety of ties and I would often select the tie to match the color of the suit that I was wearing. When you look at pictures of engineers at this time, 
They all typically wore an identical uniform of dark blue or black suit jackets and thin black ties. I don't have formal high-tech background, but I did work in an Intel facility for eight years, and I later worked at a Japanese high-tech company located in the United States for a while. So I've been around enough engineers to know that they are not necessarily the type of people that want to wear a variety of ties, and most of them are happy to wear the same style of clothing day after day. So the reason I bring this up is that it does seem a bit odd that of the 100,000 particles lifted from the tie, there were only three of these titanium alloy particles. It seems like if they were working with them on a regular basis, that there should be more than three found on the tie. Just something that I thought was odd, but may not mean anything. Even if Cooper was an engineer at one of these facilities, it could be that he had a tie that he wore day in and day out, accumulating all kinds of titanium on it. Something happened to the tie, he discarded it, got a new tie out of the drawer, which was the one that was left on the plane, a tie that he only wore for a couple days at his employer before heading off to Portland, Oregon during Thanksgiving week of 1971. Just a possibility. Some people have speculated that Cooper could have bought this tie at a garage sale or a thrift store or gotten it from his brother-in-law, and that was the source of the titanium. That could be an explanation. Since we do not have the chain of custody from the time that the tie was purchased at J.C. Penney to the time that it was left on the airplane, we cannot be 100% sure where, when, and how anything found on the tie actually got there. And even if the tie was picked up at a particular facility, such as REM crew, does that mean that only an engineer in that lab would have picked up the particles? Again, there were only three particles on the tie. How many particles might a mail clerk who was probably wearing a tie pick up when he went into the lab? They've speculated in other videos that Cooper could well have been some type of government inspector. He goes into the lab, pokes around for a couple minutes, gets a couple molecules on his tie, leaves, goes into the next room. A local reporter comes in to do a story about a local business and picks up a couple molecules. A reporter from Fortune magazine comes in and does a story about a cutting-edge Pennsylvania high-tech business and picks up a couple molecules. Molecules get into the HVAC system and are blown around. The CPA picks them up when he goes in to visit the facility. The more I think of it, the more that only three particles, even if you could narrow them down, without a doubt, to one particular lab, the fact that only three particles were found would seem to indicate that it could be many people besides the engineers and almost exclude the engineers involved because they should have more than three molecules out of the 100,000 on the tie. And we don't even know if the tie somehow got contaminated in the possession of the FBI. I have a lot of respect for the FBI, but we have to remember that at this point, the understanding is that they destroyed or lost the eight cigarette butts that Cooper left on the plane. So can we say with 100% certainty that whatever container the tie had been kept in had not been cross-contaminated with something else that contributed some or all of the 100,000 particles found on the tie? I made another video, which is quite popular, looking at the case in Australia of the Somerton Man, which was a very mysterious case that had all kinds of wild speculation that he might be connected to Soviet espionage ring and liquidated by the forerunner of the KGB, but in the end, very little about the clues in the case turned out to be meaningful when it came to identifying the true identity of the deceased. Earlier this year, DNA revealed the true identity of the Somerton man, and it was somebody that was never on anybody's radar and had no connection to the wild speculations that swirled about his possible origins. I bring that up because there's so much of the Cooper case that seems to point to soldiers or paratroopers or engineers or this candidate or that candidate. And in the end, if we're lucky, perhaps DNA will help solve this mystery. But we need to be cautious because while we have the tie, if there is DNA that possibly can be recovered from it, we can't positively be sure that it is necessarily from Cooper. Ties can go do a good job of picking up a lot of particles. And just imagine if somebody wore a tie for a long time, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, for a number of years, because ties don't readily wear out how many microscopic spit particles from co-workers ended up on Cooper's tie just from co-workers speaking to each other in very close proximity? 
I think the answer is an extremely large number. So unless we are able to get DNA that undoubtedly comes from Cooper, then we can get misled. Although if we are able to get DNA that can positively be traced to somebody that worked at a specific facility, even if it wasn't Cooper's DNA, but one of his co-workers, that would certainly narrow the field to look at when identifying Cooper. Okay, this video has gotten a lot longer than I had expected. I'll wrap up now, but be sure to watch part one of this two-part series. If you made it this far, I do appreciate you sticking with it, and I would love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this? As I end here, please subscribe and continue clicking the like button and leaving those comments. I really do appreciate them. Thanks so much.